Thank you very much indeed for your kind invitation and the uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to give uh, a uh, 40, 45 minute presentation on the work I've been doing for many years, uh, which is the use of sound or ultrasound for the uh, development of water electrolyzer and fuel cell electrocatalyst and electrodes. I'm going to stop my video just to ensure that uh, we have a good uh, quality for the presentation. Okay, so uh, really I'm gonna start on the motivation for the work. Um, so, there we go. Um, why uh, do I want to do that work? Um, as we all know that uh, in fuel cell and electrolyzer systems, especially for low temperature, we're using a quite expensive uh, platinum group metal catalyst. And, um, and we, uh, there's a strong move there to uh, uh, either reduce it or find alternatives. And also we want to investigate how we can produce those catalysts in one pot synthesis. So uh, before I start with the work uh, that I've been doing over the years, I just want to give, uh, give a, a few slides on why hydrogen. And as we know now, uh, everyone is talking about it, the flavor of the month, hydrogen is, uh, is back on the agenda. Um, I've been in the area for 20 years uh, and uh, we've seen uh, really uh, actually 20 years ago when I was working for Johnson Mathe fuel cells, you know, uh, people were talking a lot about fuel cells and how this fuel cell could be um, uh, actually rolled out into different sectors. Uh, and 20 years later, now we are focused pretty much on hydrogen and it's back on the agenda, which is great. So why hydrogen? Highest energy content of all fuels on a wide basis. Um, and the amount of energy produced by hydrogen per unit weight of, a, of fuel is about three times the amount of energy contained in equal weight and, uh, of petrol and almost seven times of coal. But the problem with uh, with hydrogen, it has a pretty uh, energy, a low uh, energy density per volume at uh, standard temperature and pressure. So this is actually a big problem. So you need to do, um, uh, you have to need to transform the hydrogen into different states. You know, uh, obviously uh, you have to increase the, the, the pressure, so on the bars, which is uh, what is used for vehicle applications, or you have to liquefy it at minus two, 153 degrees C. Um, this uh, slide is very important to me. I mean, I've never seen that uh, uh, really in my career uh, in the hydrogen area. Uh, and uh, I was very delighted when on the 7th of July of 2020, uh, the EU uh, put forward this strategy where this, they said stipulated very clearly that they, they would invest 130 billion euros as initial investment to the, the, uh, this hydrogen split in different sectors, which is electrolyzers, offshore wind, offshore, onshore wind, uh, sort of PV, uh, with some really uh, specific targets for 4.4 million tons of renewable hydrogen, and with a combined investment in the areas of Ukraine and North Africa, in particular Morocco, uh, with uh, 91.5 billion to produce an, an extra 4 million tons of renewable hydrogen. Overall, actually, if we focus on electrolyzers, um, in the EU, that would generate around 170,000 jobs and the potential annual revenue by 2050 is estimated around 820 billion euros, which is absolutely amazing. Um, in, in terms of creating 5.4 million jobs. So all those actually numbers, obviously, the estimation, but uh, this is a good news rate for the industry. The European Commission's hydrogen strategy is very clear, three stages, very fast. We need to really uh, ramp up the uh, production of, of high, renewable hydrogen. So 2024 is to produce 1 million tonne of renewable hydrogen. 25 to 2030 is to increase the energy production and produce 10 times more renewable hydrogen and to decarbonize large parts of the uh, energy sector in the EU and industry. And then the more difficult part would be with the other 20 years, which is the final stage, is to moder modernize and fully transform the sectors which are really difficult to decarbonate, for example, as we know, in this world, the transport and the maritime sector, okay? And so this is really the good news I wanted to say. Um, I'm 
really uh, what uh, the strategy is really clearly stipulating here, we want green hydrogen. So there's different ways of producing green hydrogen or we actually with green electrons, you know, solar PV, hydro. I mean, uh, live in Norway on hydro is very big here. 96, 98% of electricity comes from hydro electricity. Um, and also obviously the wind. Uh, so but in order to, to produce this green hydrogen, you need to use a special technology, which is low temperature electrolyzers to produce your hydrogen and as well your oxygen, which is also another commodity gas. So um, in the sector, so I'm going to only focus on low temperature electrolyzers. There are really three main uh, electrolyzers. One of them is more uh, mature than the other. So if you talk about the proton exchange membrane water electrolyzer, electrolyzer um, this you have to use pure water. You're using PGMs, um, um, you know, iridium and uh, on, on, on platinum. Um, then you are, using, you are looking at another technology, which is more mature, uh, the alkyl water electrolyzer or electrolysis, which there you're actually using potassium hydroxide and some kind of uh, nickel alloys, alloys or runny nickel. So non pigeon based, which is great. Um, this technology has been really uh, around for many decades, or many years, in fact, Norway was one of the, uh, I would say, precursor of that technology uh, for the fertilizer um, really uh, industry. And then we have some another technology which, which is really, uh, I would say, still at research and development stage uh, based on uh, anion exchange uh, membrane water electrolysis, combining uh, the, the pros of the two other technologies, the PEM water electrolysis and the alkaline water electrolysis. And there, there in that technology, on the ANWE, you can use dilute KOH, you put as hydroxide, any type of carbonates, and you also use non precious metals uh, uh, like nickel, iron, and cobalt oxide, for example. So, I'm going to focus here uh, on the PEM water uh, uh, electrolysis. So, what you have really uh, on the uh, you've got the oxygen evolution reaction, the OER, uh, which is uh, really the one of the uh, sluggish uh, reaction here in contact with iridium oxide. Um, you get about two to, four, two to four milligram of, of iridium oxide per square centimeter in terms of loading. Uh, in between, you've got a kind of a methylene mem membrane. And on the cathode side, you get basically the hydrogen emission reaction, where you get some loading of platinum between 0 0.025 to one milligram per square centimeter of platinum, and you've got your hydrogen production uh, on that side. So. Um, this is quite uh, a very uh, attractive uh, uh, technology because uh, Norway has been very well researched, very well established. We've got companies like Nail Hydrogen, which is a Norwegian um, electrolyzer manufacturer who uh, a couple of years ago um, acquired Proton Insight and are making actually on paper the largest uh, water electrolyzer um, manufacturer in the world. And you go also, also in the likes of ATM Power Base in the UK, and also, as you know, Cummins, who actually bought uh, Hydrogenics in Canada, were also into those sectors. So, two tech prominent um, really technologies, the PEM water electrolyzers and the alkaline, alkaline water electrolyzers. So, they have both of them have pros and cons. One would be actually most, much more expensive than the other, and less durable. So, for example, from PEM water electrolyzer, they're very expensive, but more durable, so they can actually last a bit longer. Alkaline water electrolyzers, and obviously they are much cheaper, so they're a factor of 10, but the durability is not that great in comparison to PEM water electrolyzers. Now, let's talk about PEM fuel cells, it's been around obviously for many major fuel cells. We are looking at again the use of, of PGMs, you know, platinum. Uh, as the main component of on the anode and cathode side, where you on the cathode side you've got the oxygen reduction reaction, and you've got uh, on the on that side you've got the hydrogen oxidation reaction. Uh, again, the loading there uh, around uh, 0.05 milligram per square centimeter of platinum on the anode side, and 0.35 um, uh, milligram per square centimeter of on, on the cathode side. So I'm gonna focus on those two elements here, two PGMs. And if we do some kind of a uh, calculation, and um, I did some calculation over the weekend, and uh, if you have, uh, let's say on average, uh, you have about 0.5 kilograms of iridium per megawatt. 
um, at a loading, a typical loading of like two milligrams of iridium per square centimeter. Uh, that looking at the cost, if you go on the London Metal Exchange, for example, you're looking at around 100 pounds per gram of iridium against uh, 25 pounds per gram of platinum. Uh, the current production of, of iridium is around five tons per, per year. So if you do your calculation, those values become really, uh, really uh, high in terms of, of cost and price. And obviously, utilization. So we're looking at 500 grams, kilograms of iridium per gigawatt. Bear in mind that the EU uh, states that uh, by 2030, we will have 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer on the market. And let's assume these are all prime water electrolyzers. Then we're actually eating some big numbers. Okay. So we need to really objective is to reduce dramatically the loading of the pen water um, of iridium in pen water, uh, pen water electrolyzer systems by at least a factor of 40, uh, around 0.05 milligram of iridium per square centimeter. So there's a paper actually a few years ago that I published with um, Imperial College and uh, a gentleman who used to work for N NREL in Colorado, where we showed actually the evolution of really the automotive fuel cell cost over the years and um, you know, I was talking about 14, 15 years ago when we're looking at uh, 120 US dollars per kilowatt. Now we actually pretty much in the region of 40, 50, and some very attractive costs for the full fuel cell electric vehicle um, uh, vehicle cost. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years, around 225,000 US dollars. Now we actually in the region about 77, 80,000 dollars. Uh, a system. So we are actually really getting getting there. But still, if you look at this pie chart here, you know, nearly half of the the cost uh, comes from the stack, comes from the catalyst. So there's a, also a lot of work to be done. Um, again, here, if you look at the USDA target of, a, you know, this, that was actually last year, 2020 targets, but we're looking at pretty much at 10 grams of total loading of your uh, platinum. And on these days, um, really with uh, a loading of about 0.1 milligram per square centimeter, that would be the target at a, at a cost of around 30 US dollars per kilowatt. So as you can see over the year, quite a substantial really work in reducing that uh, amount of, of really of platinum, you know, by a factor of 10-ish, you know, over really, 16 years, 15 years. So that's a good job that, that we, that's been um, really undertaken. So the problem, is that really a problem with platinum? But let's let's assume it is a problem. You know, we're looking at uh, 25 pound a gram, 100 kilowatt uh, a stack here at a loading of 0.4 uh, gram per, per kilowatt. And it's a typical loading of a total of 0.4 milligram per square centimeter in total. Now that require about 40 grams of platinum, about a thousand pound, okay? So the objective, as I said before, is to try to reduce that loading to 10 grams per 100 uh, kilowatt. Okay, is that scarcity again availability? Yes, I mean some studies uh, show that it's going to be actually you're going to hit uh, actually a, a point where it would be not enough to supply the the market. But um, you know, other school of thoughts were saying that actually we can so very good actually recycling now, especially from catalytic converters, etc. So we can really reach those those uh, those big numbers. If, if we were to imagine that all cars uh, in the world were uh, fuel cell vehicle powered. Um, then obviously we can't we get away with it. This is, you know, again, you know, pool bay as well, you know, uh, platinum dissolution, especially when you're cycling your fuel cell at a different potential, high potentials, you go aggregation and sintering, but also you've got your carbon corrosion happening uh, quite a lot. Okay, so if for those who are interested, this was published in 2019, I think, and I uh, could send you the link. And it's quite a, a, uh, a interesting uh, paper uh, looking at uh, really uh, the, the myths around platinum and its availability and etc. Okay, so now there's different ways of really reducing, uh, you know, the, the cost. You know, if you're focusing on the catalyst, you can decrease the PGM loading on the electrode, decrease the nanoparticle size. You actually develop new type of uh, PGM-based alloy or caution structures. Uh, you actually move it completely from uh, PGM catalyst to non-precious metal catalyst or PGM-free catalyst. 
you look at also the novel wave fabrication method to synthesize effectively the fission catalyst, and you also looking at other system to develop um, really um, new type of electrofabrication or electro for fuel cells or pen fuel cells on pen water electrolyzers. So what we want there is better catalyst dispersion and also utilization, which is something which is important in the area. So there's different ways. So you know, chemists, uh, you know, to prepare your your, your catalyst, you you have the uh, chemical uh, route. You know, you use alcohol reduction, citrate reduction, the polyol reduction, the sodium borohydride reduction that's been, been used quite a lot, and you also move into something which is more uh, phys the physics really, or a photolytic reduction, radiolytic reduction, laser ablation, and other type of of, of chemical routes. And what I want to present is actually really we can get those nanoparticles in situ by using sound, or ultrasound, or in fact, even also using combination of sound on electrons, okay? So what is power ultrasound? Um, power ultrasound is uh, in the area of 20 kilohertz to two megahertz. Uh, it's above the human hearing. And um, the diagnostic uh, ultrasound is used for prenatal scanning. If you go to the hospital and, uh, you know, if you want to see the, the, the shape of your of your baby, then they will use a diagnostic ultrasound and you'll see a, a quite nice image um, of, of the baby. But uh, what we are looking at here, it's uh, in my area, it's in the region of 20 kilos to two megahertz. In fact, now I've actually reduced the work of my area to 20 kilos to one megahertz, where I get more uh, effect of ultrasound effect. So um, what is sonochemistry? So it's not so no chemistry, it's actually sonochemistry. Is the use of sound energy to produce chemical or physical change in the medium through acoustic cavitation. And this is where the first slide of my PhD supervisor, Professor Tim Mason, when I, I was in 1994, was um, really uh, uh, discussing uh, ultrasound on chemistry. And for me, it's quite a good description of what sonic chemistry is all about. So, what you have is you have a sonic wave propagating through a solution, you've got zone of compression and rarefaction. And imagine that you're doing that at 20 kilohertz, 20,000 times per second. So you're doing quite a lot to the solution, or you're creating, creating cavities. And all those cavities, they tend to uh, grow and, they, uh, and then reach uh, a, a unstable uh, radius or stable size, and then they collapse. And upon collapse, they produce some jet of liquids of around 20 meters per second, sometimes 200 meters per second, close to the surface. And some people are. It's, like melting and epiracid, so you a work that you can produce upon cavitation implosion, 5,000 uh, Kelvin in temperature, 2,000 to 5,000 atmosphere in pressure. So this is your physical, uh, I would say physical effect. So you will have your surface being eroded, but also you have the chemical effect. Okay, it's called sonolysis. So what is is what you do, you are uh, splitting, if you like, your, your, your water molecule into radicals, so hydrogen radicals and actually radicals. Um, in a, in a way, you by recombination, you're producing hydrogen peroxide. So this is one of the papers uh, that uh, actually showed, uh, you know, by the use of electrochemistry, that you could reach up um, with a jet of liquid to 200 meters per second, okay? And hotspot, this is where you get most of your uh, energy focus in one, one area. All right, so erosion. It's very simple. So this is your transducer sonicating at 20, uh, 20. This is this is actually a, a PIV uh, uh, imaging here. And you can see like this intense area around the transducers. And if you leave, let's say uh, aluminum foil, treatment foil for a few seconds, you will see pinholes. And in fact, quite a lot of damage uh, around uh, of your uh, aluminum foil, okay? This is how intense ultrasound is. Water oil emulsification. I'm a Frenchman, I love my mayonnaise. And you can actually really make your mayonnaise by um, using um, ultrasound sonication. You get a very lovely emulsification of, of your wa water oil uh, after a few seconds of sonication. What's also good about uh, ultrasound, you can have an effective degassing. It's, and it's very important for uh, uh, electrolysis. And this is another subject, another topic of my research, but uh, we demonstrated that by using ultrasound, you could effectively remove any hydrogen and oxygen bubbles at the electrical surface, and you get a better efficiency of your system, especially when you pulse the ultrasound. 
and that's um, also I was saying earlier on, sonolysis. Sonolysis is, uh, as I said, uh, you're producing your hydrogen radicals or actually hydroxy radicals. And the quick test to do that, you have a luminal uh, experiment. It's a chemical which actually emits lights um, when uh, subjected to those hydrogen radicals. And you can do uh, quite uh, a nice experiment with using uh, ultra fast imaging in a black box. Um, and you get this very uh, obvious and lovely blue light. Another area also, which is part of sonochemistry, I'm also using electrochemistry with ultrasound in order to produce your, um, uh, your nanomaterials, for example. I will talk about that in the next few, few slides. And um, there's a really uh, a, a breath of other area where you could use uh, the ultrasound in electrochemical engineering on electrochemistry. So you could, for example, have a few, uh, few done some few research that we also looked at mass transfer measurements. You could um, also uh, use ultrasound to uh, get a better plating, um, you know, metal coating. Uh, it's also used in battery as well, uh, electrodeposition, electrocrystallization. And, and I used to work um, uh, in the Midlands, and we know that the uh, the bashing industry and the electroplating industry was quite big. And you know, I had a few a few uh, really um, work with uh, the lo the local industry to use ultrasound in order to make their deposit much more. Uh, much improved and also free of hydrogen double entrapment, which is a big problem when you do electroplating on electro deposition. To do your uh, ultrasound or to apply ultrasound to the system is very, I would say, quite, it's quite easy in a way. You know, you don't have to spend to break the bank to, in order to get um, really some solution to the system. So you can use a probe, a vibration 20 kilohertz, you can use a bat. This is a normal ultrasound machine in bat, but you have in the labs. And you have other also more, I would say, a sophisticated system out there for the industry. The problem when you use probe is that after really a long term of operation, you get erosions, and that could be a, a big issue when you're inserting your uh, tip directly into your your system, where you will have, uh, you know, uh, this is actually titanium, alum, aluminium, vanadium alloy. Uh, it's very strong, but it does unfortunately uh, does erode because of, of cavitation bubble including the surface. In terms of electrochemical cells, it's uh, pretty much really box standards. Uh, we, we try to do electrochemistry um, we, uh, in uh, either uh, uh, using a, uh, a salt bridge or a junction. Uh, you know, we try to, uh, for those who are electrochemists in the audience, we try to not have the uh, reference electrode in contact uh, with the uh, sonicating uh, field. Um, in order to make sure that uh, the reference electrode is not affected by the ultrasound. You have other systems here, the Meinhardt, a German company, or you have your transducer plate at the bottom here could vibrate 20 kilohertz up to, let's say, uh, one megahertz. Um, then you have uh, other systems where you want to look at, for example, the, uh, the work we've been doing by producing nanoparticles or electrocatalysts it was in a small volume, and where this volume was not in contact with the sonic Sonicator, the vibrator, and you get uh, really this area being um, really uh, subjected to ultrasound, but with no contact from the probe. Okay, so another image is here. This is also you could um, um, look at different uh, cooling fluid because obviously when you use ultrasound, you have an increase of temperature, and this temperature may affect also your electrochemistry or your chemistry. So you need to use some kind of coolant, and this is uh, a coolant. It was a silicon oil. Um, we used it under pressure and, uh, and uh, we wanted also to have all cavitation events happening in the inner liquid here, which is basically a post solution, uh, rather than having all these cavitation events happening in the, um, in the silicon oil. Another system here that we've done here in TNU, uh, where you have your trans uh, transducer plate, you've got your inner jacket here, and you've got also your um, your uh, inner cell for your electro, your chemistry or your electrochemistry, and this is a direct uh, probe uh, immer immersion to your system. So, um, really, uh, ten years ago, um, I put that out and uh, did a bit of a, a, a really a search in the on the um, in the um, literature, and there was a lot of work being done in the fabrication of nanoparticles or metal nanoparticle monostructures and coarser structures using sound. People were using surfactant, people were using 
prototype of alcohol. And uh, really that uh, led us, uh, you know, a few years ago, actually, to uh, look at uh, uh, a system where we use uh, two different uh, uh, ultrasonic systems. Uh, one was a bath, one was the, um, uh, uh, the probe and a different frequency, one operating at 20 kilohertz and the other one at 408 kilohertz. And what we found is that, uh, you know, if you wanted to, uh, we were able to tune the ultrasonic parameters uh, in order to obtain a specific particle size um, without the use of any stabilizing agent. The problem is that when um, 10 years ago, people were using quite a lot of surfactant on alcohol, surfactant, as we know, if you want to get rid of that surfactant on the nanoparticles, pretty much a pain and you need to do a lot of um, really uh, chemical uh, cleaning, if you like. Uh, but what we're trying to prove is you can uh, tune on the radical formation um, and in order to get a fixed, um, really a range of nanoparticles with your platinum. And we got actually some very good uh, particle size around two to uh, 2.5 uh, nanometer in size. And we did also some bor sodium borohydrate uh, experiment only without ultrasound, and we got in, in the region of three. But the way we found also is that all the nanoparticles found, uh, uh, produced by chemically were of spherical size, uh, shape, sorry, um, and uh, which was different by using the chemical approach. Okay. We also found that we had uh, a more monodispers, uh, really, uh, um, phenomena, if you like, of the of platinum nanoparticles than the chemical reduction uh, method. So that was good. So we actually put forward in that paper that's uh, really the uh, H dot uh, act as a releasing agent, really. Uh, so if you're using chloroplatinic acid, for example, then it gets straight into your, your platinum nanoparticles. Then uh, if you had to use different surfactant or alcohol, you go different steps uh, in order to get into your uh, metallic uh, 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 state zero. Also, the effect of surfactant, which is a big thing, you, um, we look at uh, how can we uh, use, uh, you know, ionic surfactant and ion surfactant in order again to control the sizes. Um, we found actually that uh, with, um, you know, non, uh, non ionic surfactant, we can get some really quite uh, good sizes, or, you know, around one nanometers, and then uh, compared to ionic surfactant. So, different types, so, you know, um, S, S, um, DBS and SDS, et cetera, the usual suspect. Um, and then um, back in 2009, we decided to look at really how can we, can we actually use ultrasound and electrochemistry together in order to produce uh, those nanoparticles. So uh, there was a page on paper with, uh, uh, with the University of Padova, Padova, where we looked at using this uh, the ultrasonic probe as a working electrode. In other words, we use the uh, electrode as the vibrator. So everything was earth. We um, uh, really had a working electrode linked up uh, to the total source pad. And we had uh, also a reference electrode away from the field and a counter electrode that had been actually platinum, or it could be an, another um, actually uh, reference elect uh, counter electrode. But uh, by playing with the uh, galvanostatic pulse and the ultrasonic pulse, you could play also on the size. Okay, so you know a few, a few milliseconds of, 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 of current, or that we know where you get at your um, your nanoparticle formation or your platinum formation, then a blast of ultrasound to dislodge these uh, nanoparticles from the solution. Okay, now this is also a bit of a up to date, uh, really, uh, I would say, a diagram, but you know, we looked at this electrochemical reduction pulses and ultrasonic pulses in order to get the uh, nano size nanoparticles that we wanted. Uh, we focused pretty much really on the chloroplatinic acid here, uh, the reduction here, uh, at this potential, uh, at this uh, reaction here. And uh, I don't wanna go through the details, but so when I send you the PDF, I will leave them in there for those who want to repeat those experiments. But um, we looked at um, pretty much first uh, where we get, we did some cyclic voltammetry, a box standard electrochemistry voltammetry, uh, and the chloroplatinic acid. I wanted to find out where we got uh, platinum uh, formation of which area, uh, which potential, and then use the potential in order to get those uh, the nanoparticles in on, on the surface of the evaporating uh, electrode. Um, so we got very nice, uh, surprisingly very nice, uh, really images here, you know, around, you know, 
you know, the 10 nanometers in science by spherical nanoparticles of platinum, even with uh, by using electrons, if you like, or by using uh, electrochemistry. And those uh, those uh, really uh, sizes were quite on average was around 14, 10 to 14 nanometers. So we done obviously some X, X, um, X, um, X ray diffraction and, and, and also confirm the 111 structure of your platinum. And what we found is that uh, the platinum has the sole role to induce gravitation phenomenon um, and to ablate also in the mixed metallic nuclei from the cathodic surface. Um, so um, to, we also found out that all the platinum nanoparticles formed at the surface were in single phase, which was actually a FCC structure, of course. I mean, it would have been so nice to find a different structure on the ultrasound, but uh, um, that's uh, another topic of the of the research. So what do we have? You are uh, you have your chloroplane acid, a pulverizing current at, at the electrode. You are actually forming your uh, really nanoparticle surface, a blast of ultrasound, pulse ultrasounds, and then you've got your platinum nanoparticles. Uh, you've got uh, the potential agglomeration and dissolution if you are not using any surfactants. Um, we saw all the aqueous solution. That could be also a, a, a big drawback. Um, then really you could look at the using different uh, surfactants to do that in order to separate all the nanoparticles. But the problem is that we start to clean those nanoparticles. Then uh, with some uh, um, team uh, in Germany and in Greece, we thought, uh, uh, why not actually look at uh, having this one point synthesis? Okay, so having really um, having your platinum and carbon and in the presence of your uh, ionomer all in one. So I'm going to do this quickly here. So um, what we have, this is the standard catalyst uh, configuration. You actually get your platinum and carbon, uh, super catalyst. You mix it with your nafine, which is your ionomer. And you are using a solvent. It could be AP or another type of solvent, a blast of ultrasound, or you're producing your uh, catalytic. Okay, what we are suggested in there is that you are uh, uh, starting with your high surface area carbon support. Um, then you do your electrochemistry or your chemistry or your sonar electrochemistry on it, sonar chemistry. And then you are doing basically the rest of your preparation. So this is what we had in mind. But here, uh, what uh, we actually extended that work to, okay, let's do that in one point. Industrially, it would make sense. You don't, you want to use less chemicals. You don't want to be environmentally friendly and you want to speed up really your reaction times. Okay, so about really, um, you know, uh, making the most, uh, be more efficient in um, producing your catalyst. So what we proposed here, we have uh, really your uh, uh, SA carbon support, a basal ultrasound, with your nothing dispersion, your solvent, and then you are producing all in one pot, your platinum carbon in, okay? So this is actually what we use. Uh, we used uh, a 20 kilo syndication, uh, 20% amplitude, and we use the extra uh, chloroplatin platinum acid, very low concentration, we start with water, and we use the Vulcan XCS 72 carbon black power, which is quite famous in the future business. Um, very, very good, uh, very good, uh, really uh, carbon, uh, carbon substrate. Um, and we did also some electrode deposition pulse at different uh, time regimes, if you like. So, okay. So we've got some interesting data here. So this is a nanoparticle of, of platinum on the carbon uh, particle here. And we got some attractive uh, particle size uh, around five nanometers uh, in, in distribution here. This is a TM image. You can see those nice uh, platinum nanoparticle on the carbon substrate, okay. Um, so um, what, um, what we notice is that, yes, we can get those five nanometers uh, of uh, nanoparticle size, uh, but uh, we also found that uh, among uh, the so many minutes of sonication or pulse, then you had the detachment of those nanoparticle platinum from the substrate. So don't forget that um, really, um, that's a, uh, 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 um, um, uh, support the support the carbon support and, and 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 the platinum bonding is quite weak. Okay, um, so we also saw we did some ACPMS work and we also saw that uh, we had a partial formation of larger uh, platinum nanoparticle. Uh, sorry, on dissolution too, and also larger part particle nanoparticle formation. So they tend to aggregate and dissolve back into solution. Okay, 
Then we did some uh, the usual evaluation of electro catalyst. This is the model film film catalyst, uh, catalyst electrode that everyone is using. You know, a famous uh, gas tiger, etc. We actually came up with, uh, with, the, 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 with the process of screening electro catalyst. So we look at um, really those uh, nanoparticles, you know, you know, mixed again catalyst ink. You actually drop, drop cast them into your classical electrode in a free electrode system. That electrode is uh, immersed in an end to purge. Uh, um, Perfluoric acid, on surgery, or surgery acid, or you do basically your calculation or your electrochemical surface area in the area here, in that zone here, um, which is basically the uh, hydrogen under potential deposition. You do, of course, your TN microscopy, and in some occasion, you use the Shea equation to get a guesstimate or actually to ensure that what you found in TM uh, is actually on par uh, with uh, what you get from the Shea equation. Okay, this is also another thing that people tend to forget. Catalyst utilization is important. You can have the best catalyst in the world, but if that catalyst doesn't do anything towards the reaction, the chemical reaction, then you have a problem. So what we found is that um, uh, when we uh, used our uh, stonochemically or stonochemically produced electrical catalyst, we had actually some catalysts which were on par with the usual suspect on the market, PKK and Johnson. So um, for the last bit here, I've got uh, actually five, six minutes. Uh, there's different ways to produce your um, electrodes. Um, could it be low energy fuel cells or electrolyzers, mainly plain water electrolyzers and plain fuel cells. So you could uh, use a gas division layer uh, where you are depositing your platinum uh, supported on carbon catalyst ink, and then you are ending with a gas diffusion electrode or GDE. Or the other option is to use your membrane um, electrode, which separates basically the anode side to the cathode side uh, catalyst layers. And um, you deposit that straight, uh, your catalyst being straight into the, this uh, membrane, could be lap ion, and you actually end up with a coated catalyst membrane of CCM. And there's different ways of doing that. Um, one is the decal, the blade process with painting, painting and spraying. Um, this is an example actually of a CCM um, um, assembly line that, uh, that my uh, team and I uh, many years ago at ICA system put together, and we were looking at uh, system development and system manufacturing for pen fuel cell and pen water electrolyzer. Okay. So the, those MEAs and membrane electrode assembly, with, or CCM, sorry, are quite thin in, in, in uh, thickness. And this is actually, I'm sure for those who, who are in the business, are making million pound business. And uh, this business will obviously grow now because of, of hydrogen being the flavor of the month. So what I did uh, in 2009, I think that's right. So I looked at preparing those electrodes by the interesting way, a bit like actually using, um, you know, like in the electroplating industry, using ultrasound in order to get a better deposit of your uh, catalyst uh, uh, ink onto the, the substrate. So I use uh, uh, in that in, for that instance a GDE, and I looked at basically I did some uh, IV, which is a, a typical performance uh, uh, curve here. And I did some uh, IV curve on, 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 on performance curve and I looked at by using ultrasound and it could increase of 125 milliwatts per square centimeter your, your, your power. So this was due to uh, the, we had a better deposition of your platinum active uh, on the platinum on the surface uh, and the loading was acceptable in all places of your um, electrode. And we also uh, noticed that we had a decrease in platinum cells, which helped into. So this is an SCM image here. You can see that no, no ultrasound per some is with pulsing only uh, with uh, with uh, uh, electron with uh, uh, static, uh, galvanostatically. So you get uh, a platinum agglomerate uh, uneven surface by using ultrasound. Your surface is more uniform. Okay, we get a better fuel cell performance. We also found out that in that work and papers been recently were submit and um, uh, published. Uh, 10 years ago, we also get better platinum utilization. It's a work actually that we did uh, with uh, one of our students uh, um, at, uh, when I was at uh, Birmingham, we had good, good, uh, good work that we done with the conjunction with a company called um, um, Sonotech, where we looked at uh, different type of um, really ultrasonic uh, spraying system, you know, going from 20 kilohertz to 200 kilohertz. And we looked at really at lowering the, the loading 
of uh, the anode and cathode sites. And what we do is we've actually discovered is that by using this ultra spray technique, we could increase the performance by 50%. And also the good thing is that we could also uh, lower the uh, loading of the platinum in order to get similar performances, and which is very interesting. Okay, this is uh, SEM uh, uh, top views and cross section reviews. What it could say from those pictures is that we got a, a better uniformity um, uh, of, of, your, uh, of your catalyst ink uh, onto the surface of your substrate. Okay, this is an another example here where, again, was a saying early on, is that we got a better catalyst ink dispersion distribution, better platinumization, and we could get to uh, peak power density on par with those uh, uh, with uh, with no ultrasound, even at low, even low loading. Okay, so 24 milligram per square centimeter compared to 2015, and it, it has the, the peak power density was even, even slightly better than those with no ultrasound. So this was uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. But um, since I have now uh, one minute, um, I've got a student at uh, NT News looking now um, at the uh, at, uh, it's done the platinum work, and the, the paper has been actually just accepted a few weeks ago. But uh, looking nickel, and also more importantly, the main task of this work is to scale up. Okay, so again, this one point synthesis for the industry. Okay, so how can we get those uh, air catalysts already made under irradiation? That's why I call it ultrasound ir irradiation beam, if you like, and to use that catalysting to produce your CCMs, et cetera, or GBEs, et cetera. Um, this is also another work that I'm, I've gone going with uh, Dr. Shiata Supati at RC System at the University of Washington Cape, where you're looking at the production of uh, erbium oxide from uh, using uh, ultrasound. And we are using uh, between 20 kilohertz and one megahertz to see where, where uh, we can find a sweet spot here. And we know that way if we increase um, the uh, frequency of your ultrasound, you get more cavitation events, more um, sonolysis events, and more uh, adduxy radicals and H radicals formation. So we want to know where we get uh, really uh, maximum uh, really yield, but also uh, the size that uh, which are uh, attractive to time water electrolyzers and time fusers in you know, uh, instance. Conclusion: So time fuser and time water electrolyzer can be produced so no chemically and sonolytical chemically. And we've also found during the last past 10 years that we get the electrochaotic properties which are on par with commercial ones. And what we want to do it is, yes, it is possible to produce your platinum carbon ink in a weapon synthesis, sonochemically and sonolytical chemically. Uh, last but not least, but um, uh, I would like to thank uh, the collaborators over the years, but also the students actually who actually worked on on this, uh, these systems. And um, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. For those who are interested in uh, knowing more about um, ultrasound and solar chemistry and solar chemistry, there's a book out there which was published last year. And there's also a series, uh, hydrogen fuel cell series um, out there, um, which is published by Elsevier. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Bruno, for a really interesting talk. Um, does anyone have any questions for Bruno? If you could type them into the Q&A and I will write them out. Um, I have a quick question and apologize if I missed this or have misunderstood this. Would you be able to do sort of the sonoelectrochemistry in non-aqueous solutions? Yes, yes. Um, one of the papers, I, um, 2005, I think we looked at the uh, deep protected solvents on the uh, RTIL. So we actually demonstrated we could uh, uh, do the uh, sono chemistry and sono electric chemistry in those, uh, in those, uh, so basically the solution solvent. Yes, absolutely. The thing, the thing which is very interesting is that um, what we showed is that um, if you have prolonged sonication, you also are affecting the uh, deeper solvent. Okay, so you'll see a discoloration over time. So if you do some UV spec, uh, you would see that um, basically it starts to degrade. Okay, but uh, and the other point is that some of these um, um, oh, ionic liquid, let's say, uh, are also quite viscous. Okay, 
and uh, ultrasound can, at some point, can struggle in passing on, uh, really, on transferring the ultrasound energy into the system. But there's a point where, if it's prolonged, again, to do with degradation, with prolonged sonication, you have uh, your sonication get, gets better. So uh, it's, uh, it's just like your uh, liquid will become much more, uh, much, much, much fluider. Uh, there's a word there, but more, um, less viscous. Yes. Yes. Um, so Sam Sullivan also is asking, what level of control can you have for the nanoparticle synthesis through sonochemistry? So um, it's all um, down to, um, so what we, uh, the paper that we just published, that uh, we showed that um, you could control the radical formation uh, over time. Um, and um, you could actually say, say, okay, I want to produce X amount of H radicals. And that would give you uh, basically um, that amount and also the size of your nanoparticle. So um, I could send you the, the paper for you to read, but you could um, effectively play with the, uh, it's called the sonic chemical efficiency. Uh, you could play with the um, uh, radical formation that can guesstimate the radical formation that would give you uh, really a certain size of your nanoparticles. In a way, yes, but I, I must say that sonoelectrochemically, it is much easier because then you can control galvanostatically the time of pulsation, okay? And also uh, the, the time of when you want to dislodge that nanoparticle from the, from the, um, from the electrode, okay? So it's, if you play with your, uh, the, the time, um, if you like, uh, sequence of communication on, 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 on the current, you could effectively play with your particle size. Okay, so that would be, I think, would be more. In fact, electronically, you can do that very easily. I think. Okay. Yeah. So Rodolfo has. How do you scale up ultrasound technology? This is a very good point. Um, it's um, it's feasible because uh, um, if you uh, look, there was a company that I used to work for uh, before I left the UK for uh, no uh, Norway, a uh, company based in Swansea, where they actually scale up sono uh, electrochemical systems for the water treatment industry. And they've done it very well, actually. It's basically, they, um, they were using uh, ultrasonic transducers um, and to promote uh, the dissolution. They were doing electrocoagulation. And they were to promote not only um, the dissolution of, of, of the anodic electrode material, but also to promote mass transfer. And it's actually, it, we actually got some very good data. In fact, that, uh, that uh, system is out there on the market and it's been utilized by water companies or one or two water companies in the UK. So check, check them out. Um, but, um, I don't lose any advertising here, but if you actually uh, put uh, uh, some electrochemical systems in, um, in, in, in action wells, uh, you will find that uh, this, this is actually uh, running. There's another company called Yelsha, uh, Yelsha in Germany, who are um, really uh, plugging those electrochemical, so those um, ultrasonic systems into different markets. Um, in fact, they, um, they, uh, they are looking at uh, hydrogen production uh, using, uh, using ultrasound. So um, yeah, it, it is feasible. The, the, the thing is it's uh, really, um, although it's easy to use that in the lab, I always say that you need to get your hands dirty in order to understand ultrasound. Okay, so that's that's the bottom line. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Bruno? Oh, he explained everything so well. Can't see any. Oh, there's one. Um, so how does the ultrasound affect the formation of alloys? Ah, very good. <laughs> Uh, so, um, very good. Uh, this is actually subject to, uh, uh, to uh, my student, and Henry, because we want to look at uh, nickel oxide and uh, nickel, um, actually, uh, other type of alloys, absolutely, uh, nickel, uh, nickel iron. In fact, we demonstrated when we first started that uh, we can make a series of different type of nickel-based uh, systems. Um, um, yes, um, that's, that's possible. And it's been demo demonstrated, uh, in fact, by, by Enric uh, last year. Um, 
not published yet, but uh, yes, yes, we can produce alloys for sure, for sure. But you know, it's all do, it's all to do with uh, really uh, uh, your uh, what you have in your solution, um, and then you know, if you assume that uh, all your edge dot are reducing edge, and then you know, so uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's also, uh, for those interested, and maybe diversion away from the nanoparticle, but maybe in line with, uh, we, can, we just published a paper where we looked at uh, uh, CO2 conversion using ultrasound. Um, and and uh, we found that um, in different media, different ultrasound frequencies and systems, you could actually produce, uh, you could reproduce uh, uh, the Sabatier reaction at, uh, at uh, at um, very uh, at low temperature, or actually at, at uh, room temperature. Sorry. So um, and that, this paper has been out now, and um, it's we, we actually named it the Sono, Sono Sabatier, where we actually postulated, or I postulated a few years ago, that um, all these cavitation bubbles act as macro macro reactors, and within those macro reactors, you got um, basically your your CO two as as vapor or whatever it is as gas. So where you can get up this conversion and we found that uh, yeah so there's me it's quite a complex uh, uh, situation but maybe i'm diverging too much from the core of this uh, presentation very interesting yeah are there any last questions there's nothing come in on the chat oh <laughs> every time i say that something comes in so uh, rodolfo is saying compared to conventional chemical processes how does the energy consumption compare mm -hmm. That's a very good point. A very good point. So um, we um, we done some uh, analysis. Uh, in fact, it was part of. Uh, so you you could gain on on if you were to pulse your ultrasound. So the idea is not to use uh, continuous ultrasound. You need to to pulse the ultrasound at different time uh, time intervals. But um, um, you could gain in some process. I'm I'm not generalizing here. I'm just looking at the process, for example, the CO two reduction. Where you could actually improve it by you know 10, 15, 20 percent. Okay, but uh, this is a very good question. Um, the idea is that um, you don't want to have your ultrasound on uh, 24 hours a day. What you need to do is actually really look at pulsing, and pulsing will definitely improve your efficiency. That's from my experience. Okay. Um, but if you have access to green electrons, you know, you know, so that's, uh, yeah, that's not maybe not another subject, but uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, when I did my PhD in 1994, uh, the ultrasound transistors were so expensive and it was, it was impossible to scale them up or to deploy them into the industry. Uh, but now, you can get a transducer, literally 20 kilos transducer. So you go to alibaba.com or wherever it is, you know, you can get them for 10 quid, you know? So it's, it's, it's just, the, okay. I, I, would, I would not actually uh, say that they are reliable, but you can get such a, a system out there just to play with pretty quickly. Um, which kind of leads into the next question, which asks, does the formation of acoustic cavities change with scale up? It depends actually on the um, on the volume. It depends. Yes, that's right. It depends on where you arrange your transducers. Okay, so you will need to do a lot of. Uh, of course, you need to do some modeling for sure, uh, but you need to do a lot of experimental work too to find out where you get uh, you maximize your volume to be sonicated basically. So um, um, from experience, it does work quite well for static solutions. Uh, than for uh, moving parts or moving solutions. So if you have a flow, then could be you will need to be uh, looking at maybe uh, um, uh, submersive or, or actually those uh, sonicator where you can have them in within the solution. Okay, so or the the volume. Um, but yeah, again, there's different things out there you can use. Um, but yes, it, you will have to do some uh, the modeling and. Some tweaking or some experimental work in order to maximize the cavitation events within the reactor. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Well, if, if there are no further questions, all is left for me is to thank Bruno for, for your time and for a very interesting talk. Um, and, yes. um, yeah, thank you. I'm yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's very so, difficult to end a webinar, sort of. I, I know, I know. Usually, usually we go for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea yeah. or something like that. Or maybe uh, yeah, mingle, at the end of the conference. I've got, no, got no one to mingle with at the moment, so, all right. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, we'll be able to welcome Bruno in person yes. to help at a future conference and, and you can chat over the poster session. Yeah, that'd be great. Because I, I, I miss those poster session real ones, you know. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me, Josie. So it was uh, our pleasure much, and thanks for, for giving up your time. Okay. Have a